All right, so this is a pretty important chapter, Acts chapter 17, because, uh, you know, the last, just to give you a little review, you know, they left uh, Thessalonica where they had a lot of um, trouble, conflicts, persecution. They went to Berea. The people there were far more open, and they wanted to, they wanted to study the scripture and see if what Paul said was true. And um, so then, but the Jews followed them there, the Jews who were against um, the Christian message, you know, the Messianic message. Remember, everybody's Jewish. Paul's Jewish. They're Jewish, but they're, Paul believes in the Messiah, that Jesus is Messiah. They don't. So they're very contrary to that message, and they come to try to stir up trouble. And as a result, um, the leaders there send uh, Paul away. And he goes over to the coast and then takes uh, either the road or, the, or a ship, we're not sure, and he went on down to Athens. And when he got to Athens, he told the guys that brought him there, bring, bring Timothy and Silas as quick as you can. Tell them to come quickly. Because he just, I don't know, he just sensed he needed them there. They, they stayed behind to help the new believers back at, at Berea, you know. But um, he said to bring them. And then it says that he was very disturbed because he saw that the whole city was given over to idols. And so this is, you know, I talked about this last time. This is, you know, the famous city of Athens where Plato was from, where Aristotle also taught with Plato and before he started his own school where Greek philosophy had a lot of its start, you know, and Socrates was from there and, and um, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant people, uh, sort of a foundation for Western civilization, uh, Greek philosophy. It's one of the cornerstones of Western civilization. And yet, in spite of the many things that were brilliant about them, their art, their, their buildings, their democracy, you know, governmental ideas and so forth, they were nevertheless idolaters. They're just given over to idolatry. And so um, it's pretty interesting. You know, uh, I'm taking a, uh, an online philosophy course now. When I have time, I watch, I, you just watch videos and you take quizzes. It's free. It's from um, Hillsdale College. And, um, it, and, and I also just read a book on philosophy. Um, by a guy named Ed Fazer on my Kindle, on my phone. It's real good. And uh, philosophy, there's worldly philosophy that's wrong, but philosophy itself means love of wisdom. That's what the word means, phileo, I lo you know, love, and Sophia is wisdom. So it's the love of wisdom. And um, it's really interesting that both Plato and Aristotle, if you read their writings, which I've mostly read, just excerpts that other other professors have us read, but they believed, they used reason to arrive at the conclusion that there has to be just one God, that all the gods of the Greeks and all were not right, because uh, it's a long story, I won't go into it, but it's like Aristotle called him the unmoved mover, because every single thing in the world that he looked at, something else made it happen. Like if there's an oak tree, there was an acorn, but that acorn came from another oak tree. And so you can go, you know, if there's a kid, there's parents, but those parents were kids and they came from other parents and everything goes back. And if a rock moves, it's because there's a stick that moved it, but the stick moved the rock because somebody's hand was moving the stick and the hand moved the stick because the arm was moving the stick and the arm moved the stick because a brain said, I want to move this stick and move this rock. And and so then, but then the brain came with the body and the body came from parents and the parents came from parents and so on. So Aristotle said, as he thought about it, he said, there had to be something in the way back that initiated everything and it has to be one, not many, because uh, that's a whole complicated philosophical thing. But anyway, they, they came up with just through reason, many of the concepts that lead you to monotheism. Um, but they also had lots of different philosophies and differed with each other. Just like today, we have many different philosophies. Everybody has a philosophy. Everybody thinks in a certain way. Why do our people today think the way they think? They think because they're taught in the universities are all controlled by the left. The media is all controlled by the left. 
and big tech is all left, why are they left? Why are they not right? The left's ideas mostly are anti-God and dangerous. Many of the right's ideas are too, because they want to be malicious and violent and take over and so on. But why have our people come to think this way? They think certain ways. Why? And we're called conservatives because we want to conserve ways of thinking that are from the past. So I don't like that. I want to change it because um, it was the past because a lot of people were Christian. But people don't remember that anymore. And I think instead of just saying we're conservatives, that makes them, the left thinks, oh, you're just backward. You want to be in the past. No, we, it's not that we want to be in the past. It's that in the past, they understood some basic philosophical foundations that are just the way reality is. So we're realists. That's what I think we should be called. We are realists. We don't believe that a child can be male or female. We believe they are one or the other. That's reality. We don't believe that you can fly if you feel like it and you can, if you really want to, you could do it. We don't. We believe there's a law of gravity. You can't fly <laughs> unless you have an airplane. Um, we don't believe uh, that sexuality should just be free and you can just do whatever you want because we know there's a reality. Children come through sexuality. The best way to have children raised and be responsible is to have a mother and a father and to have the kind of a family uh, situation that produces well-being. So we're not in just in the past. We're into reality and the Bible conveys reality. And so um, I, I want to, I've been thinking about this. I want to change our names from conservative to something else. But anyway, it's just interesting when he came to Athens, there, they were brilliant philosophers. And even when he came, there were still philosophers. There were Epicureans and there were Stoics. And it says that, and he dealt with them. And there have two different kind of worldviews, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Um, the Epicureans kind of said, if there are gods, they don't do anything here. And the Stoics kind of said, look, they were kind of like Hindus. A lot of, actually, a lot of Greek thought was kind of like Hinduism. The whole world is God. Everything is God. You're part of God. I'm part of God. It's all God. So there were these kind of philosophies even back then. But it's interesting to me that um, with their philosophy alone, that it didn't, it didn't lead them to the real truth because they still believed in lots of gods. And that's just false. And um, so... There can be vain human kind of philosophy and it leads you astray. We need to not just trust in our reason and what we think up, because you can think up all kind of stuff. We have um, a worldview that's based on truth that was revealed. God came to Mount Sinai and revealed the Ten Commandments to the, Moses and the Jews. Christ came to the earth and he revealed God to us. No one's seen God at any time, John 1.18 says, but the... But the word, the son of God has revealed him. <clears throat> so we understand who God is because he's let us know who he is. He's revealed himself to us. And that's, you know, a sure truth that you can grab hold of. So now we ended up with Paul interacting in the synagogue as always in Athens, but also dealing and arguing with people, reasoning with people in the marketplace, the agora, the, the marketplace. He was reasoning with these philosophers and everything. Paul went after folks. And so the people there in the area, in, the, uh, in that area, they said, we want to hear what you are, have to say, you know, because you're bringing about, bringing some really strange views before that we've never heard. And uh, you can just shut that door, Myron, and just shut the door. Thanks. So anyway, they, they wanted to hear him. So they, they said, would you come and speak to the group called the Areopagus? And the Areopagus is on this place called Mars Hill. And that's what Ares is, the god Mars. The, the Romans called him Mars. The Greeks called him Ares. So uh, the Areopagus is Mars Hill. And you'll still see churches today called Mars Hill. One of the biggest ones is in Seattle, Mars Hill. There's a big one in somewhere in Michigan. A guy named uh, Ron Bell started uh, Mars Hill. And you'll see here of uh, ministries called Mars Hill. And the, the reason is because Mars Hill is where Paul went and spoke to these philosophical people, these, these intellectual type people, this, 
the city council, but they were the they were the elites of the city, and they invited him to come. They also they uh, they led the city. They also did. Uh, they were like a court, and if there was a case of murder and stuff like that, they would they would uh, hear cases like that. So they were like the court and the elites and the the intellectuals and the directors of the city, that kind of thing. So they asked him to come and speak to him. And so now we come to verse 22. So Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus. 1722. Okay, 1722. So Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and he said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. Now some other versions say you're very superstitious. And the Greek word says superstitious. What version? That's New King James. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's possible to translate either very religious or superstitious. Very religious is kind of positive. Like, you know, well, you people are very religious, you know. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's good. Uh, so let me talk to you about that. But superstitious is more uh, derogatory. Like, you know, you people, you know, you believe in a lot of crazy things, <laughs> which is more, you know, it's liable to put people off. But anyway. He said, I see that you're very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. And some versions say, to unknown gods. And um, this is a known thing from history. We know that these, these, these altars existed, um, and we know that these folks um, had their gods, you know, Zeus and Apollos, Apollo and uh, Poseidon and uh, or Neptune, the, the the Roman version and Athena and all those gods and goddesses, right? And so they they believe they had this whole story of you know first there were the Titans, Kronos and all the them you know and then from them came the other gods, the gods of Mount Olympus and there were battles and stuff and that's how the world began you know these gods fought and everything. So they had their Greek gods. The Romans basically just took the Greek gods and changed the names. So Zeus became Jupiter, Ares became Mars. You know, Diana became, uh, uh, Artemis became Diana, stuff like that. But anyway, they also, it was a port there. Piraeus was the port of Athens. And and you had people coming from all over the Roman Empire coming through there on the way to Rome, on the way to the Middle East. So you had Persians with Zoroastrianism and you had Mithraism, another religion of the time. There were other religions and things. So these folks thought, you know, to cover all the bases, We'll have an idol, an altar to the unknown god or gods too, not just all the ones we know, but in case we're missing somebody, because we don't want to make them mad, because you know they might they might get mad. The gods they you know make volcanoes blow up and kill you or things like that. So you got to keep the gods happy. So he says, look, I walked around, I found this altar with this inscription to an unknown god. So he's going to use that as his uh, point of like his uh, his diving board, like his point of departure to to get into a, a, a talk with them. Now, what you worship is something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. And by the way, unknown there is, is like agnosis, and that's where we get agnostic from. So if you're an agnostic, you mean it means you don't know. You just say, I don't know, I don't think anybody knows, and stuff like that. So what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. And so now he launches into this talk that he gave on Mars Hill, that is one of the most, like it's the classic speech from the Apostle Paul to a group of pagans, to a group of Hellenists, Hellenistic pagans. And remember, he's a Jew, but he's a Hellenistic Jew because he was raised in in Cilicia, and he was raised speaking Greek and Hebrew or Aramaic, and he was trained by Gamaliel, the leader of the, one of the greatest rabbis of Israel. But he was also very familiar with the Greeks and their language and their customs and all that. He knew their poetry. He read their their writings. He knew all that stuff. And so this is a classic speech now, sermon, or or just an oration that he's going to give to these heathens. And we're going to see how he does this. So he starts off talking about something they can relate to, this altar to an unknown God and their gods and so forth. But then verse 24, he starts to tell them, who the real God is. The God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth, and he doesn't live in temples built by hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he gives he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. So there he's telling them something that Aristotle kind of knew, that 
God and even Socrates, you know, Socrates was killed for being an atheist and leading the youth astray, but he wasn't an atheist. He just said, you know what? I don't think all the gods we're worshiping are really what it is. I think God is something else. It's a pure something, one something. And so they called that atheism because that's, he's turning the youth away from the, the gods. But uh, this is the most basic reality of the, of the universe. You know, God made everything. And so he's Lord of everything. And he doesn't live in temples and he's not served by humans because he doesn't need anything humans can do. Because let's face it, he gave us life. We didn't give him anything. And so he's, he's addressing the thoughts they have in their minds, how they think of God. Who is God? God is the creator. And he gave human life as well. He gives men life and breath and everything else. So all life originated from God. You know, biologists, they still, they, they think they got it figured out because they say evolution's the explanation. But really, when you probe, they don't have the origin of life figured out at all. Nobody even can deduce what life actually is. We know what it does. It's like the wind. We know what it does. It moves things. Leaves blow, trees sway. You know what life does. Life moves, life eats, life, life reproduces, life does things. But what is life? When a human being that you love dies, what left? Life, their life went out of them. Yeah, where? Well, what was it? Where did it go? What is it? Just electricity? Is it energy? What you know? What is it? Spirit. Yeah, and in Latin, it's anima, spirit. So you're animated. You have spirit. And when you're dead, you don't have anima. You don't have spirit. Okay, but what is spirit? We don't know. Nobody knows what life is. Nobody knows how it came. And it's way more complicated than evolutionists think. Mm -hmm. And so the truth is, God made life. He's the author of life. He created it. And verse 26 says, From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them in the exact places where they should live. So this, you know, it's interesting to think of how many billions of people are alive now and how many have been over the history of the human race, right? We're, we're what, 7 billion, 8 billion, nobody knows for sure, right? But we're billions now, and over the thousands of years that we've existed, how many more were there? You know, sometimes millions of people were wiped out by plagues and stuff like that. So how many people have lived? But it's interesting. They all came from one couple. Isn't that interesting that God wanted to fill the earth with people, but instead of just creating people here and creating people there and creating people there, you know, he created one couple and he had it the way he did it was from that one couple, it all spread. And so <clears throat> we multiply and we spread around. And he, he determined the times we would live in. So, you know, you were born when you were born and you'll die when you die and your, your gravestone will say that, you know, from this, you know, my birthday is my, May 19, 1954. And then I'll, I'll end some point, right? The Bible says here, he determined that, you know, you Warren, you're going to live in the 20th and the 21st centuries. I think it's interesting when you study people like, you know, some people are born in the beginning of a century and they make it through the whole, they're mostly in one century. Some people were born in the middle, they make it into the next, then they die. Some people were born at the end, like my kids were born in the 80s. The end of, my grandparents were born in the 1880s. My kids were born in the 1980s. And you're born in a certain segment of time and you live through the change of a century and other people don't, they just live in one century. But God apparently no, this, no, not apparently. It, it says he determines where we'll be, when we'll be. I was made to be an American, so were you. Some people are Mexican, some people are Russian, some people are Albanian, whatever. He put you there. And that's where he wanted you to be for some reason. And then it says, verse 27 tells us the main reason that we live for. This is the purpose of life. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. So, so this is really the purpose of life. I've been mentioning this a lot in sermons. I don't know if people ever understood what I was getting at. But Acts 17, 27 tells you the purpose of life. You were made and put on this earth to find God, to seek for him and find him. But he's not far from you. He's right here, like the breath you breathe. But 
That's your purpose. Your highest purpose in life is to find God. So I did a funeral last several weeks ago for a Puerto Rican guy up at the other church. And I said, you know what? He accomplished the purpose of life because he loved the Lord. And so he fulfilled the most important purpose. Of course, there's other things God wants you to do. He wants you to be a nurse. He wants you to be a mechanic. He wants you to be a writer, whatever. You might be famous. You might not. You might be a leader. You might not, whatever. He has purposes. You know, you're going to do things. You're going to help this one and that one. And you're going to have these children and so on, whatever. He has a lot of purposes. Of course, our lives have a lot of purposes. But this is like the essential purpose for which we were created. It's to find God. And if you find God in your life and you die, then you made it. It's like you, you, you accomplish and realize the most important thing in life. Everything else is peripheral. It, 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 you know, everything else. Did you find him? Did you look for him? Because he made you, you must find his purpose for you, not your own purpose for you, his purpose for you. He made you and he wants you to find him and be with him. Relationship with him is what he made you for. And if you find him, that's going to last forever. You're going to continue in that forever, that relationship. So it's pretty big. If you don't find him, you miss the most important thing of all of life. We're supposed to find him. And so um, Aristotle even said, the highest purpose of life is contemplation of the ultimate good, the good. The highest purpose of life is really when we worship God on Sunday and we worship him and we praise him or during, during the week, that's your highest purpose of life, that you would seek him and worship him, give him what's due. That's what we're made for. And so then he says, verse 28, for in him, we live and move and have our being. See, God is the supreme being, right? Nobody else has being, if not for his being. He is the supreme being. He gives being to everything else. He brought everything else into being. And so in him, in, in his will, the way he wants it, we're living and moving and that's what we're here for. That's how we exist. We wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for him. And then Paul shows here some really, uh, how he was so culturally relevant, how Paul was such a great missionary to Greeks as well as Jews, because here he's, he says, as some of your own poets have said, we're his offspring. And so he knew what Greek poets said. And one of my commentaries that I read was cool, and I, I won't spend the time on it now. I can't remember it, but I'll tell you, just mention it. Who the poets were, we know. We know what poets he, he was re referring to. One was called Epimenides, if I remember right. And so uh, he wrote, uh, in him we live and move and have our being. By the way, in first Tit in Titus 1, I think it is 12, Paul said that the, the Cretans are always... Uh, lazy gluttons evil beasts and you know stuff like that and uh i didn't know but that's a straight quote from the same poet from one of these poets he was quoting a poet so he knew their poetry now we americans we don't like poetry that much when i go to russia kazakhstan all that they're real into poets they have statues of poets everywhere we have statues of statesmen and stuff they have statues of poets everywhere they when one Russian guy was going to teach me Russian, he said, you're going to have to read Pushkin, the, the poet, because he's the greatest poet. And that's how you're going to learn Russian, reading that. They're into poetry. And so these people were into poetry, too. Poetry is just, you know, I mean, we like we like um, folk singers and stuff. They have uh, the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls. You know, uh, we have. Yeah, we like that. And we like uh and I still haven't found what I'm looking for, you know, Bono. And those are our poets. So we like that. We like that stuff. Sometimes their words get our emotions, you know, they, they communicate something really cool in a short way. And so he knew what these guys, what kind of poets they had and what they said and everything. He read their stuff. And so he could refer to it. And that let him see that, hey, this guy's pretty sh sharp. You know, you know, he's a Jew, but he knows our stuff. He, he can relate to us. And so in him we live and move and have our being, he said, as some of your poets have said. And then also we're his offspring. Another poet said that. Uh, we're the offspring of God. And by the way, I think we need to clarify there. You know, we're not, I tell people, you're not all God's children. People say, well, everybody's God's child. Well, not 
technically, not in the technical sense. But like this says, we are his offspring in the sense, the general sense, he made us, right? He made everybody. Human beings wouldn't be here if God hadn't made us. But according to John 1, uh, 12, 11 and 12, you're not really a child of God until you believe in the Lord Jesus and receive him. Because to as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become children of God. So until you're born again, you're not in that sense, a full child of God. You're a child of God only in the created sense. I hope that makes sense. But you're not as full of a child of God until you've been born again because you have a satanic nature within you that you got from Satan. That's what we have when we're born in this world and we need a new nature. So you have to be born again to really be a full child of God. But anyway, he quotes their poetry. And then um, uh, verse uh, 29 Therefore, since we're God's offspring, we shouldn't think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. This is where he gets to, uh, to uh, kind of correcting them. And this is where he teaches um, the, the way he uses kind of the law of God here in a subtle way without saying, you know, Deuteronomy says this or Exodus says this. Exodus 20 says, you shall have no other gods before me. He doesn't quote scripture because they're Hellenists. They're Greeks. They don't know the scripture. They don't have that background. But yet he gives them a biblical principle. We shouldn't think that the divine being is gold or silver or stone. We shouldn't think he's an image made by man's design and skill. We should not think that. But you guys do because you got statues everywhere. You got the altar to the unknown God. You think these statues and all represent God. You shouldn't think that. So it's really like the first commandment. You shall have no other gods or the second commandment. You shall not make any image. So he's like preaching biblical principles from Jewish revelation from the Old Testament. But in a way that he relates it to these Greeks by talking about their their poetry and stuff. And so he's really telling them there what repentance is. He's telling them they need to repent. And he says it here in another verse, but I want you to see that what is repentance? Repentance is changing your mind about how you think about God and yourself and your life and where you're going and stuff like that. He says, we shouldn't think this. That means you should change your mind. You shouldn't think that. You should think something else. And then he says, verse 30, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. See, that was ignorance agnosticism you don't know you didn't know and but now he commands all people everywhere to repent so see he's he's saying what you've been doing what you've been thinking how you've been living is wrong and in the past God overlooked that he only chose the Jews and he worked with them and he's been working with them for 1400 years or whatever but now a new day has come and God commands everyone, everywhere to repent. See, kind of interesting. This new age of the Messiah, because Jesus has come, everything's changed. It's no longer just the Jews. It's the messages for everyone. And everyone has to repent of what they've been trusting in and believing in and, and running after and start understanding that God has come in the form of Jesus Christ and you to live for him. So he commands everyone everywhere to repent. That's a Greek word, metanoia, which means change your way of thinking and change your attitude and your actions and so on. And then look at verse 31 because he says really what you got to understand as to why you need to repent. He says he set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. So look, he starts off with God, the creator, and now he ends with God, the judge. And so everybody needs to understand there's coming a judgment. God is going to judge the earth and he's going to do it through the man that he's appointed. And he's given the, the sign of that by raising him from the dead. So see, that's real. We got to tell people about the judgment. Uh, Hebrews 9.27 says, Is it appointed unto human beings to die once, and after that comes judgment? Revelations 20 says, I saw, Revelation chapter 20 says, 
I saw a great white throne and everybody was gathered before him. And, you know, the books were opened and the, book, the, look, the Lamb's Book of Life was opened. And everyone whose name wasn't written in that book was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So this is the message of the gospel. Who is God? What has he made us for? We're to live for him. We're, if you're not living for him, you need to repent of that and change and change your direction, change your life, change your thinking and live for him. And if you don't, you better understand there's coming a judgment. You will stand before him. And only the people who have bowed their knees to Jesus as Lord will enter into life. The others are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. That's what the, that's what this great apostle preached to a bunch of heathens. You know, worshipers of other gods. He still gave them that basic message. It needs to be our message. The judgment of God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, I think, uh, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Why? He, the, what's the terror of the Lord? It's the judgment. You're going to go before God. If you're not perfect in thought, word, and deed, you will be condemned. So it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's what Hebrews says. And so... We need to preach about the judgment. Everybody needs to understand that, that you're going to be judged by God. And so, and then it's just very interesting verse there where he says, uh, he'll judge the world by Jesus. I preached a message on this two or three weeks ago about Jesus, the judge. People don't realize that Jesus is going to be the judge. John five said that Jesus said, God's not going to judge. He's committed all judgment to me because I'm the son of man. And I think it's because he's been a man. That's why he's going to judge men because nobody can say, you don't know what it's like to be a man. Oh, yeah, I do. In fact, I walked the dusty streets just like you, and I died. I was killed by you. I know what suffering is. I know what it's like to be on the earth. I know what it's like to be tempted. That's why Jesus is going to be the judge. And it says here, um, God has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. So the resurrection is meant to be the proof that, um, that Jesus is the judge. I want to look up this word, um, I'm going to look up this. This is that's the NIV I just read to you. But now I'm going to look it up in Greek and see what it says here, where it says proof. He's given proof. Let's see what the Greek says here, if this will hurry up and open. It's being very slow. Something's wrong with it. Yeah. Um, by that man, he's, he has given assurance. Guess what it says in Greek? Piston. Piston is the word faith. That's where we get the word faith. Pistis is the Greek word for faith. In this conjugation, it's pistin, pistin. And it, it also means persuasion. You've been persuaded of the truthfulness of God. So, see, God has given persuasion. He's given proof. He's given evidence. He's given faith by raising Jesus from the dead. Let's see what other versions say. Um, he has given public proof of it by resurrecting this man from the dead. Another version says um, he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And the new revised version says, let's see here. He has given assurance to all. Okay. I'll check one more. Uh, what's King James? King James says um, he has given assurance unto all. And then... Uh, let me look at the Amplified real quick. Amplified says um, he's given conviction and assurance and evidence to everyone by raising him from the dead. So our faith is based on the resurrection. When you look at the resurrection, that's God's sign to you. This one is the one who's going to judge the world. Jesus. He, it's just like when he came at the baptism, God said, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And when he raised him from the dead, it's like he's publicly declaring to the whole world, this is the one I've appointed to judge the whole world. This is the one you must give allegiance to. You're going to have to bow your knee. And in Isaiah 45, God said, Yahweh said, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. And then in Philippians, in Romans, Paul quoted that and he said the same thing. But in Philippians 2, Paul quoted it, but he changed the words. He said, the, the God has ordained that before the Lord Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. So 
Every knee will bow before Jesus. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess he's Lord at the day of judgment. And uh, the proof is God raised him from the dead. You look at that and you say, okay, so that's the sign. That gives us the faith. So verse 32, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered and others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. By the way, Greeks did not believe in resurrection. They did not believe in that at all. Um, they, you know, Plato said your body is like a cage. And when you die, you're set free like a bird from a cage. You're, it's good to get out of your body. Not that you're going to get a body again. You're going to be raised again from the dead. The Greeks didn't want that, um, you know. And some of them believed in other things. They believe like the whole, there's a world soul. So when you die, it's kind of like Hinduism. Your soul just goes into the world soul like a drop of water falling in the ocean. So they had different beliefs, but they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. But Paul preached it. That's the way it's going to be. Everybody's going to be raised and they're going to be judged. So some of them sneered. So, you know, but Paul, I mean, look what he did. He, he preached to Jews just, you know, and, and the, and the Jews went crazy and attacked him and hated him and stuff. And he preached to Greeks and they sneered at him. But some people everywhere he went did believe and they were affected in the right way. And so he just kept on doing it, whether they sneered or whether they cheered. Right. And that's what we got to do. And they said, we want to hear you again on this subject. So it seems like that in this speech that he gave here, um, he, you know, you can't say everything in every sermon or whatever. So he didn't go much into who Jesus was, what Jesus did, what happened after, what you got to do now. He, he just sort of talked about what's before that, that, you know, God wants you to repent of what you're believing in now. And, and he wants you to, to turn to him. He's going to judge and, and, you know, it's through his son. And so they said, we want to hear you again on the subject. We don't have any record that he ever spoke to him again. Uh, maybe they didn't mean that. So I've had lots of people say, yeah, yeah, I want to talk to you about this more. And they never do. You know, yeah, I want you to come sometime and visit their house. We'll talk about this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to come to the church. But they never do. <laughs> so maybe that's the way I was here. Um, verse 33. After that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus. So he was one of these elite guys, one of the intellectuals of the city council, the leaders there. And he believed and he followed Paul. And also there was a woman named Damaris and a number of others. So it says that he became followers of Paul and believed. But it's interesting because in, um, let me see where it is. First Corinthians, I wrote it down here somewhere. First Corinthians 16, 15, it talks about the household of Stephanus. And it says they were the first converts of Greece. So this is his first trip into Greece, and he said it says here some believe, but it says in 1 Corinthians that it was only later that there were some other people who believed. Doesn't sound like um, doesn't sound like really these people became Christians. We never see that he planted a church there or anything, but a few people followed him. They listened to him, you know. And this guy Dionysius, he um, in about uh, hundreds of years later. I can't remember if it's 6th century, 7th century, somewhere in there, there's a guy who called himself Dionysius, the Areopagite, and he wrote a, a bunch of things. But then later, scholars discovered that he was from the 5th or 6th century, so it wasn't this guy. But he, he wrote stuff in the name of Dionysius, and he said he was Dionysius, the Areopagite, but he really wasn't. He was a, he was a Middle Age, uh, in the Middle Ages, and, uh, and he... Uh, but he wrote some some stuff and Christians used his writings a lot. But this guy, we don't have any record of any writings by him. We don't have a record of a church there in Athens or anything like that. Later, you know, Paul started, he leaves here and he goes to Corinth and he starts a church there. And we have lots of records about Corinth. So we got a church going there. But, and it's weird because Corinth was more of kind of a wicked, Corinth was very wicked, um, very worldly and stuff like that. Athens was wicked too because they're all idolaters, but it wasn't as famous for, you know, immorality and all that kind of stuff as Corinth. But Paul got a church going in Corinth. He didn't get a church going in Athens. Maybe their intellectual mindset just uh, blocked them, hindered them from really believing, you know, and um, there's people like that today. Their, their mindset doesn't allow them to even hear anything about God. They, they won't listen to it. They won't even entertain it. They dismiss it. No, that's stupid. 
you know, because like to them, the whole thing is material. That's all there is. Mm -hmm. The physical universe, you know, no, there's no, there's nothing. They won't even think about it. And it's a shame because some of the most brilliant people of all time have been Christians and there's a lot to think about and they made very good arguments. And most of these idiots like today that don't want to think about it, they're, they're closed minded. Some of the new atheists and all, they mock Christianity like it's stupid and oh, you know, nobody that has a, a mind could possibly believe in that. But this guy I'm reading, Ed Fazer, his, the philosopher, he says, yeah, right. You people have never read their writings, have you? For a thousand years, they've been writing very profound arguments, very great testimonies and witness to the Christian faith, but you didn't bother to read it. And then you think you're educated. You're not. So anyway, this is the story of how, how Paul, you know, worked with these, with these folks. And, and, you know, we can learn, you really learn a lot from his, uh, from his message there and what he taught.